Psalm 121 from the King James text reads in this fashion, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord one more time this afternoon. Master, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace as it is our privilege as children of God. Master, we need grace at this hour. We're imperfect people doing our best to serve and please a perfect and holy God. Master, you have taken the weight of responsibility for salvation off of the shoulders of men, and you have taken that weight upon yourself, going so far as to die upon the cross of Calvary, that we might become partakers of your righteousness and your perfection by faith. Master, anoint at this moment the speaker. Help me, Lord, even with this venue to be anointed of the Holy Ghost, to deliver the Word of God faithfully, accurately, powerfully, in love, Lord, that the people of God might not merely hear it in their hearing, but they might receive it in their spirit. Lord, today, let the chisel of the Holy Ghost be loosed and carve these words which are about to be spoken upon the tablet of our heart, helping us, Lord, making us living epistles read of men. Master, in the name of Jesus, touch the ear of every hearer. Help every individual that will hear this word. Help every individual, Lord, to receive it with a heart of gladness. Lord, that it might bring forth fruit in our lives unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask it all in none other but that wonderful saving name, Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the Lord. Boy, I'll tell you, there's not a Psalm 1 that reads any more uh, inspiring and uplifting in my mind than Psalm 121. If anything in the world helps us to understand that we need to look to God in our time of trouble, we need to look to the Lord in our time of difficulty, in our time of stress, in our time of fear and anxiety, we need to look upward. My Lord, folks, what a shame that so many of God's people fail to receive what God has to offer them simply because they never go to him desiring that which he offers. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, I don't know about y'all, but I'm, I'm a fan of some of the old classic 
television shows. I know there are some holiness people that are going to swallow their dentures hearing me say that. Well, I'm sorry for you. I like to use modern culture references in my preaching. And there's a method to my madness. When you use modern uh, cultural references uh, in your preaching, what happens is uh, the people of God, as they're living their lives and going about their daily business, uh, every once in a while, they're going to wind up experiencing something, whether it be watching something on television or reading something in the paper, that is going to remind them of uh, this message that this preacher preached on this very day. And that's why using pop culture and, uh, you know, cultural things uh, is not a bad idea because uh, people wind up being reminded during the course of the weeks and months and years that follow the hearing of any given message. They wind up being reminded of a message because they hear a reference that will trigger that memory. And I hope that some when they hear uh, certain phrases spoken and certain things said, be it in a play or be it in a television program or whatever the case might be, it in a book they're reading, I hope that they'll remember this message today. I'm a fan of All in the Family. That was a program back in the 1970s. When it first came out, it was very controversial. A lot of people don't care much for it because the primary character was a very prejudiced man. Uh, he, he had about every prejudice toward every group of people that you could ever possibly imagine. And he was uh, kind of a loudmouth, bigoted, uh, conservative, quote-unquote. And... Uh, but he was surrounded by family members who kind of helped to balance him out and kind of helped to present the other side of the argument as well and provided information to the American public that in the 1970s, telling you folks, a lot of people didn't uh, have access to the information that Norman Lear made available to the public uh, through characters like Mike Stivick and Gloria, the daughter-in-law, you know. And, uh, and Edith was a character who, <coughs> while rather flighty and simple-minded and naive, she always embraced the purest truths of the Christian faith. She went to church. She believed in God. She believed everybody was a child of God, and she believed that God loved everybody. And it didn't matter. Characters were introduced on their show of every race and every creed, every background. Uh, uh, gay, lesbian people, transgendered people were introduced on the program. And Edith, bless her heart, she just loved everybody the same, the way that God's people are supposed to love everybody the same. So as I use this reference today, I hope you won't take offense uh, simply because, you know, some people, as I say, they just take offense at this program in particular. But on the program, All in the Family, Edith Archie's wife was helping her son-in-law, Mike Stivick, work on a broken sink. She was reading from a how-to book as Mike lay up under the sink doing the work. He would do something and then she'd read the next line of instruction as to what he was supposed to do. And then he would ask her, well, what do I do next? What do I do next? And she would tell him. At one point, Mike asks her the question, Ma, what do I need to do next? And Edith answers, Call the plumber. <laughs> Sometimes the best answer is to call in a professional. Trying to do the work yourself in order to save money or save time 
is not always the best answer. So it is with the Lord. Rather than trying to do things by ourselves, it is best to call on the one who is far more capable than we to do whatever it is that we need to have done. The psalmist writes in Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? Hallelujah. He said, I will call the plumber. Glory to God. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. My God, if we understand who Jesus is, if we understand the power and the capability that lies within our God, there is no excuse for refusing to turn to him when the storm is raging high and the waves are about to capsize our boat. Oh, friend, I want to tell you, when you understand he is the creator, glory to God, of heaven and earth, the word of God said in John chapter 1 concerning the man Jesus, he created the world and the world knew him not. Glory to God. He is the creator. He is the one who put every star on the palette that is our nighttime sky. And children, I got news for you today. There isn't a trouble. There isn't a problem. There isn't a difficulty, a trial, a tribulation, or a torment that can come your way that our God is not capable of turning around for you. Glory. Oh, we need to be reminded of this sometime. How many times we're running around like a chicken with our head chopped off and we're trying to figure out, what do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? Glory to God. And suddenly the Spirit of the Lord will scream out in our ear, call the plumber. Glory to God. Call the one who can do what you need done. Call the one who is capable of providing you with the assistance that you so desperately need. Glory to God. In 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, the word of the Lord admonishes us, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care all your care, all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I've used this passage many times, and I've pointed out time and again, this passage, when it says, for he careth for you, that is not referring to an emotion that the Lord has for you. He cares for you. Emotionally, he cares for you. That's some of that means. That means he is your caregiver. Glory to God. If you hire someone to come into your house and be your maid, or you hire someone to come into your house and be your nursemaid, to be a live-in nurse and to care for you and to provide care for you or to provide care for an elderly loved one or a sick loved one, then uh, there is not anything too small, there is not anything too big that you would not immediately without question ask them to help you do. Because after all, that's what you hired them for. That's why they're there. When you become a born-again child of God and you come into the family of God, my friend, you become a child of God. Glory to God. And the word of the Lord says that we cry out by reason of the spirit of adoption. We cry out, I'm a father. Daddy. Help me, Lord. Glory to God. I remember a story I heard many years ago in a Church of God camp meeting. Uh, we They used to have some of the most wonderful preachers back in the day who would preach Church of God camp meetings. And this one preacher was preaching, and he talked about uh, 
a testimony that he had heard from a man who had been in World War II and was stationed aboard a battleship. And he said this man was serving uh, as a lookout one evening, and he was up in what is commonly known as the crow's nest, you know, uh, up in a platform way up high on the boat. And he was looking out by uh, night through binoculars. He was looking to see if in the light of the moon and the stars he might see any German U-boats or any uh, Japanese submarines, whatever the case might be. And it was his job to provide warning to the captain so that the ship could take any uh, necessary uh, precautionary moves or, you know, it could realign itself and reposition itself as needed. Well, he was up there looking and looking and all at once, the story goes, he saw a submarine that had actually come up to the surface and just as he laid eyes on it, that submarine released a uh, yeah, did a bomb, you know, in the direction of the ship. Torpedo, that's the word I'm looking for. Released a torpedo in the direction of his ship. And he... He didn't have much time. There, there wasn't even time for him to call down to the captain and warn him. There was no time to reposition the boat. This torpedo was headed right to the side of the ship. If it hits, it's going to blow a hole a mile wide. And that ship is going down. And that man, all he knew to do in that moment was to cry out, Oh, Lordy! <laughs> all he knew to do in that moment was to cry out to God. And he said, Oh, Lordy! And the story goes that all of a sudden, a wave came along, literally, and it lifted that battleship up in the air several feet. And that man in the crow's nest watched the torpedo go under the boat and out the other side. And then the boat came right back down and was back in its resting position. But a wave of water came and lifted it up just high enough. Oh, I want to tell you, when your God is big enough to lift your boat, hallelujah, when your God is big enough to send a wave, to lift you up above your trouble, to lift you up above that torpedo that's about to damage you and ruin you and destroy you and cost many lives, when your God is as big as that, then you need to understand there is never an excuse on the part of any believer for not crying out to God in time of trouble. Hallelujah. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, why in the world do we suffer? Why in the world do we put ourselves through so much grief and so much woe, trying to take care of the messes we make, trying to take care of situations that we stumble into, trying to take care of things that we have done either purposely or by accident, and things get out of hand, and what do we do? We run around like a chicken with our head chopped off, trying to figure out what on earth should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And the answer is simple. Call the plumber. In Psalm chapter 46 and 1, we're reminded God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the a very present help. Oh, I want to tell you, he's there for you right now. Glory to God. He is there for you right now. Now, he is a very present help. 
Glory to God. Oh, sometimes I'll tell you, I, I don't know about y'all, but I've had any number of situations in my life where I've had to do some big things and I like move or, you know, uh, especially moving and things like that. And then later you'll talk to a friend, you know, later you'll talk to someone that you know or someone who's close to you and you'll say, yeah, I had to move Saturday and blah, blah, blah. And they'll say, oh, if I'd have known, if only I'd have known, I would have helped you. Yeah, sure you would have. Well, I'm here to tell you today, God doesn't have to be told late that you need help. He'll help you in the present if you'll invite him into your circumstance. But God doesn't go where he's not invited. Amen. God does not go where he is not invited. He's waiting for you and I to exercise just enough faith to ask. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. There's faith necessary to ask. It takes faith to ask God to come into any given situation. And the Lord is just sitting there waiting. Are you going to invite me? Are you going to ask me? Are you going to call me into this situation? Praise the name of the Lord. Honey, he's there in the present. You don't have to go to him two days later, three days later, after you've made things worse, after you've really torn things up and made a mess out of everything. You don't have to wait until after the fact. He is an ever-present, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 9 verse 9, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Psalm chapter 10 and verse 1, why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? And the Lord says, I'm not hiding myself. I'm waiting for you to call me. I operate only in response to faith. God doesn't operate, honey, in response to your fear. God doesn't operate in response to your panic. God does not operate in response to your anxiety. He responds to faith. There is a reason why we are called to go to the house of God and hear the word of God preached. The word of the Lord said, now faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I don't know how many times in my life I've been going through <coughs> struggles and difficulties and trials. And I find myself caught in that trap where I'm trying to do everything I can do to fix, to correct my course, to get back on track. And for all my efforts, nothing seems to work out. Nothing seems to quite happen the way that it should. And I go to the house of God and I hear the preacher preach a message like the message you're hearing today. And it reminds me Oh, hallelujah. It stirs up in my remembrance that my God is my help. He is my refuge. He is my source. He is my caregiver. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden in that service, I find myself calling out to God and saying, Lord, I can't do it. I need your help. And I came in depressed, but I leave with a shout. Glory to God. I came in dragging my feet, and before I left the church house, I was dancing. Oh, I want to tell you folks, when we get this thing right, when we understand that God has designed the church 
to operate the way the church operates for a reason. All you folks sit out there, I need to go to church, be a Christian. Honey, you're just robbing yourself. You are just hurting yourself. The church is there for you. It's there to remind you. It's there to encourage you. It's there to inspire you. It's there to uplift you. It is there to help you cultivate and grow your faith. And the preached word of God is so important. I'm going to tell you, I've been in church my entire life. I'm 58 years old now, and I'm going to tell you, it hasn't lost its luster. It has not lost its importance to me. I understand how important the Word of God is. I understand how important preaching and teaching are. I understand how important uh, wor corporate worship is. I understand how important corporate prayer is. I understand how important it is to be part of the body because the lambs that get cut off from the remainder of the fold are those that wind up between the wolf's teeth. Those that separate themselves, they wind up sickly, they wind up lost, they wind up caught up in the thorns and the thistles. And my friend, they are the ones who become prey to the enemy. You cannot cut yourself off from the fellowship of God's people and expect a good result. It doesn't work that way. In Psalm chapter 27 and verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me. He shall set me upon up upon a rock. Psalm 37, verse 39. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Psalm 91, verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Psalm 91, verse 9, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, Thy habitation. You know what it means to make the Lord your habitation? That means that's where you go to go to sleep at night. Hallelujah. That's where you go when you need to eat your meals. That's where you go when you need to rest your head. Oh, glory to God. He's your home base. He's your safe place. I don't know about you, but I made God a long time ago. I made the Lord my habitation. Glory to God. He's my home base. Praise God. At night when I come home, I want to lay my head down on the lap of Jesus. Glory to God. At night when I come home, I want to eat from uh, the table that he has prepared for me in the presence of mine enemies. I want him to feed me. I want him to care for me. I want to be in a place where he can do what he has said he would do. And he said that he would be my caregiver. But you know that lamb that wanders off and gets lost out away from the fold? The shepherd can hardly be that lamb's caregiver because the lamb isn't where it's supposed to be. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you today, call the plumber. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're experiencing, it is time to call the plumber. It's time to call in the one who can take care of things. Praise the name of the Lord. Psalm 94, verse 22. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. Psalm 18, verse 3. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved 
from mine enemies. Psalm 55, verse 16. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I'm just trying to remind you today, folks. You don't have to work everything out by yourself. You don't have to work out all of your healing from past hurts. You don't have to work out all of your bruises. You don't have to work out all of the messes that you've made and all of the dilemmas that you've put yourself in. The Lord says, no, I'm here. I'm just waiting for you to invite me, to call me, to ask me into your circumstance. Can you find enough faith? Can you find just a monochrome of faith? All I need is faith as the grain of a mustard seed. And mountains can be moved on your behalf. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not. Why? Because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not. Because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. I'm one of the only preachers that I know, and I don't say this for self-glorification. Frankly, I find it sad that this statement would be true. I'm one of the few preachers I know who even dares to tell the people of God the truth in the 21st century. And the truth is, many of our prayers go unanswered because our prayers are foolish and our prayers are not deserving of God's attention. He said, ye have not because ye ask not. The only reason the Lord hadn't stepped in and helped you is because you haven't invited him in to help you. He said, but by the same token, sometimes you ask for things and those things never come. Why? Because ye ask amiss. I'm here to tell you, you may not like what this preacher says. Oh, you might prefer some of these television preachers who tell you that you can just set your sights on that car or set your sight on that house or set your sights on that man or on that piece of jewelry or on that piece of land and bless God, God will give it to you. You might prefer that preacher, but I got news for you. Their message is inaccurate. As the child of God, our first and foremost desire ought to be to walk in the perfect divine will of God. We ought to seek the will of God in everything that we do. And if we will seek the will of God in everything that we do, here's a promise from the word of God that we can count on. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, listen, according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't worry too much about praying prayers that God won't answer because I don't spend a lot of time trying to ask God for things that I'm not certain He want, that he doesn't want for me. When Tommy and I, when Tommy lost his job some two and a half years ago, and we knew, we, we knew that chances were we were going to have to relocate him finding a position at the level that he works in banking, you know, uh, him finding a position in Dallas uh, was probably not going to happen because there just aren't that level of position available 
uh, in, in great multitudes, you know, in every city. So we knew there was a good probability that we were going to have to relocate. And immediately I began to pray and I said, Lord, just open the door. Just whatever door you open, that's where I'm going to go. Whatever direction you send us, that's where I'm going to go. I won't argue with you. I won't fight with you. There are some things that I'd like. I'd like to be sent to a place where the people will be more receptive to my ministry and to our message than other cities that I've ministered in. That I would like. That, that's a personal desire of mine. I said, Lord, I'd love for Tommy to have a job where he could be happy, a company that he could enjoy working for, with people that he could enjoy working with, something that utilizes his many years of experience in the industry so that he hasn't just thrown away the last 20 something years of his life. You know, Lord, there, there were so many things that I was asking God for, but in all of my asking, I said, Lord, thy will be done. So when he sent us, when the door opened for us to come to Huntsville, Alabama, I'm going to tell you right now, folks, I am not joking. You probably couldn't have named a city in America that was more at the bottom of any list of anywhere we ever dreamed in a billion years we'd ever lived. There's nothing wrong with Huntsville. I'm not down in the town. I'm not down in the people. But this is just not anywhere we ever dreamed in a million years that we'd ever live. But when it became the door that opened to us and no other doors had opened, I said, well, I've been asking God to open the right door and to close the wrong ones. So this must be it. And Tommy and I went through utter chaos <laughs> to move. The relocation was so difficult and so expensive and so costly and so burdensome and physically it, I thought I was going to die. I, I literally, I, I know people might think I'm being hyperbolic, but I'm not. I literally thought on many occasions, I thought, Lord, I'm going to collapse under the weight of this responsibility because Tommy had to be up here in Huntsville to start his new position. And I had to literally, with all my issues that I've been going through the last several years, I literally had to work out all the physical logistics of the move by myself. And it was, I, I can't even tell you how far beyond exhausting it was, how far beyond tiring it was. I literally thought, I, there were many times I said, Lord, Jesus, you're going to have to help me because I feel like any minute now I'm going to collapse dead. I don't know that my body can hold up to this. I was having to get up early and immediately start working with people who were helping to pack our house in Dallas and uh, get boxes packed up and get the house packed up and then get these pods, these moving pods packed so that I could then call the company and have them come pick them up and bring us another one. Took us seven pods at the end of the day to make this move. I had stuff uh, that was needed to be moved that was just too big. You couldn't even put it in a pod, so I wound up having to uh, make, uh, I forget how many trips I had to drive between Dallas and Huntsville myself. I had no co-pilot, had nobody to ride in the car with me. I just had to drive, you know, 11, 12 hours each way by myself. And it was exhausting. It was frustrating. It was tiring. But you know what? Like I've told Tommy many times, I said, you know, there was a time when he and I first got together. We wouldn't have had the credit that we had 
that allowed us to make this entire move cost us nearly about $50,000, literally. And then sell our house in Dallas, which I also had to navigate the logistics of. I had to, I had to work with the realtor. I had to get carpets changed. I had to do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, and I'm doing all this and I'm thinking, Lord, this is going to kill me. But when it was all said and done, I looked and I said, you know what? There was a time in our relationship when there is no way in the universe, no way in the world, we could have even made that move. There was just, there's no way. We wouldn't have had the credit. We wouldn't have had the means to pay that much money and, and get the move physically done. We'd have been stuck between a rock and a hard place. We'd have been... Uh, in a real difficult spot. But God didn't abandon us. Hallelujah. The Lord didn't leave us out to dry. Oh, before we got to the place where such an enormous task was necessary, he made sure that we had everything we needed so that when that time came, we'd be able to do what we needed to do. I can't help but feel, we, you know, we've come here. The company Tommy's working for uh, really seems to be a wonderful company. Uh, they approach things quite a bit different than his previous employer. I've said to him on several occasions, well, looks like the Lord answered part of our prayers anyway, didn't he? Because he's working with a nice set of people, people he likes, people he gets along with, people who seem to like him real well. Uh, you know, uh, much of what we've asked the Lord for has really shown itself to have been answered. The only part of my prayer that doesn't seem at this point anyway to have gotten a yes from the Lord was send us somewhere where people will be more responsive and more welcoming of my message. That's the only part. But um, his part, Things have really worked out well. Oh, but you know what? All I can do is what God's called me to do. I'm sitting here in my house today instead of being at our little church space in Huntsville because, honestly, I'm exhausted. I've been helping Tommy all week, trying to cook meals and do things, and he can tell you Um after, you know, a few hours of activity, I'm dead. I'm, I'm dead to the world. I'm out like a light. And I will sleep for seven, eight hours. Uh, it's, it's difficult for me to do a whole lot of physical activity these days. And I say, Lord, okay, we're here. I'm here because this is the door you open. I'm not going to complain because I know that... The best course of action is to say with the psalmist, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I'm not going to run around like a lunatic trying to figure out what I need to do and how I need to do it. I'll tell you what I am going to do, though. I'm going to call the plumber. Amen. Lord, we need your help. If this thing's going to get done, except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain that build it. If this thing's going to get done, if we're going to do what I have a vision to do, if we're going to see what I have a vision to see, then it's not going to be by my effort. It's not going to be because of my abilities or my gifts and my talents, but it's going to be because I was smart enough to know that the best course of action is always to call the plumber. Amen. Call the one who can do the job and do it right. Praise the name.